Can't you just picture it? They are hopping mad. And though they wouldn't admit it, they're probably more than just a little scared about what's happening to their world. And so the chief priests and elders come to Jesus and demand, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to say and do the things you're saying and doing? How dare you ride in here being treated like a king? How dare you run the money changers and merchants from the temple? How dare you teach some of these incredible lessons you've been filling people's heads with? You've got some nerve coming in here, stirring things up, upsetting our quiet, workable system. You've gathered followers, and now people are starting to question our age-old traditions and customs. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Where are your credentials? Now, Jesus is smart enough to know that sometimes a question really isn't a question. Jesus senses that this is a trap. There are people who fear him and the change that he represents, and so they'd rather he just disappear. He knows full well these are the people who are out to discredit him, who will eventually pass a death sentence upon him. If he answered that his authority is his own, then they can make him a laughingstock. And if he tells them his authority is from God, then they will try to make him out to be a liar and a blasphemer. So rather than answer them, he responds with a question of his own. Where were John's credentials? Was his authority from heaven or from earth? The temple authorities realized quickly that the wily Jesus has set for them a trap of their own. If they say John's authority was only human, of human origins, they'd be practically lynched, for John the baptizer was widely regarded and revered as a great prophet. On the other hand, they could hardly admit that John's authority might be from God, for then they'd have to admit that Jesus' authority might also be from God. So maybe they huddle and decide he's got us cornered. Let's just feign ignorance. We don't know, they respond, which I think translates, we don't want to know. We don't want to be disturbed. We've got the religious life of the people well-ordered and under control. Please, Jesus, just go away. You see, if the temple authorities recognize that John and Jesus act with God's authority, then it means that change is coming and that God is responsible for that change. It would upset their tidy world. It would mean changing their thoughts and their theology. It might mean struggling and questioning and doubting when they feel like they finally got the questions and the answers all nailed down. I don't know about you, but all too often I want to pretend that I am nothing like the religious folks of Jesus' day. Well, I'm open-minded. I'm receptive to new ideas. I embrace change. I want to see the kingdom of God come to fruition here on earth. I pray regularly, thy kingdom come. I want to be a disciple of Christ. Yes, Lord, where you lead me, I will follow. And then I realize how much that might involve change. It suddenly hits me full in the face just how radical Jesus really is. I realized that my ideas of fairness might not fit with those of God. My notions of who's in and who's out, who's good and who's bad, may be turned upside down. I find myself being called to be forgiving. Yes, 70 times 7. To give not only my coat, but my shirt as well. To let go of my need for vengeance and to turn the other cheek. Yes, I'd like to identify with Jesus and John and the good guys in the passage. But if I'm honest, it's the religious leaders who probably mirror me best. Jesus and his message really are threatening to my neat, tidy little world. Jesus, Jesus turns everything upside down with his blessed are the poor and the last shall be first. And so we too must wrestle with this question of what gives Jesus the right to say these unsettling things, to command us to behave in these ways that may seem to us so unnatural. 
If we understand that Jesus is given authority by God, then we must take seriously the things he commands us to do, right? Jesus responds to the religious leaders' attempt to get themselves off the hook by taking a different tack. He tells them a simple little story of a father and his two sons. The father asked both to work for him. The first said no, but later went and did the work anyway. As a mother of a son, I can easily put myself in the story. Often I hear, gee, I'd like to help mom, but, but, and then he's suddenly there at my side helping me get the job done. Of course, there's also those other times when like the second, he said, yes, but never showed up. Sure, I'll do that, mom, only to find out it was forgotten or put off indefinitely. Either way, left undone. Jesus asked the temple leaders, which do you think did the will of the Father? They give the only answer possible. It's not what you say, it's what you do. Jesus then tells these religious leaders, don't you get it? You know God's way. You know the right words about God. You teach the right words every day. Can't you see the presence of God in my words and deeds? Yet you fight me all the way. You play word games and you won't consider that you too need to change. Look around. Those who have cheated and lied and exploited others are being changed all around you. And they, not you, are following me into the kingdom of God. I think sometimes we are much too hard on the temple leaders. We want to paint them as the evildoers who are so different than we are. But I think Jesus knew and understood them. Yes, some were probably evil men, but a lot of them had just sort of lost their way, gotten caught up in the religious bureaucracy, which has somehow gotten twisted and out of sync with God's heart and mind. Jesus wanted them to get on the right track. He wanted, them to, to, he wanted to see them come to a fuller understanding of God. And so he never gives up. Even in this passage, he is telling them, you, you can change. You can do God's work even though you at first said no. You claim not to know that I speak and act with God's authority. But it's not too late to concede that I am the way and the truth and the life. But just acknowledging Christ, just saying, yes, I believe, is not all there is to life for citizens of God's kingdom. God wants deeds rather than just empty words. Not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, will come into the kingdom. God expects us to put our faith into action, to do what we say we believe. When did we see you, Lord? When you welcomed the stranger, when you fed the hungry, when you visited the lonely, stood with the oppressed, listened to those who have been silenced. Sometimes we are forced to realize, what we're forced to realize is that God is calling us to something new, something different. Often that means we will experience an intense conflict between our church's life and what God desires for it to be. We will become conscious of various aspects of our idolatry, our inconsistencies. We will become painfully aware of the idols of money and materialism that we have placed as gods before the one true God. We will suddenly realize that, that we claim to stand for justice and yet are complicit in injustice in our church, in our community. It's easier to turn our heads than to raise a ruckus. Maybe we will become convicted about the contradictions of claiming all God's children as equals and then fostering and enjoying the benefits of economic inequality, our living the good life at the expense of others. Maybe we begin to realize that people hear us much more loudly through what we do than through what we say. And we must, bring, must, be ask, must be asking ourselves, what do people hear from Journey of Faith, United Methodist Church here in Round Rock, Texas? If we profess to recognize that Jesus and John were given authority by God, are we living out that profession by doing the things they taught us to do? 
In the simplest terms, today's scripture lesson asks, can God count on us? No one can feel at ease about answering that question. We know how often we fail each other, much less God. Even so, the question doesn't go away. Do we want to do more than speak or think about the faith? Do we honestly want to live it every day? Maybe we said yes, but didn't do it. But if we once said no, it's not too late. We are called to represent Christ, to represent Christ, to live as citizens of God's kingdom, to love God and to love our neighbor. I suspect that if we were to seriously live as the peculiar people God calls us to be, we, like Jesus and John, would also be hearing people ask, by what authority are they doing these things? And could we respond by the power of God in Jesus the Christ? A man had two sons. Which one are you? Thanks be to God, amen.